So as we continue this short series through some psalms, this morning I want you to turn to Psalm 2. I will be reading Psalm 2. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and against His anointed, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then He will speak to them in His wrath and terrify them in His fury, saying, As for me... I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. Yahweh said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve Yahweh with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sun, lest he be angry and you perish in the way, for his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. Blessed is the reading, God's holy, infallible, instructive, hope-filled, and true word to our hearts and our souls. Let's pray. Father, that is what Your word is. That's what this psalm is. And so I beg for the grace, the power of your grace upon us who believe and any who don't will that you cause us to allow the truth of Psalm 2 to bring great courage and encouragement and hope in the midst of our varying circumstances this day to the glory of our Lord Jesus. Amen. So, as we view human history, the turmoil, wars, slaughters, as we live through the upheaval Right now in our own society, as we watch growing totalitarian counties, governors, or the president of the United States, as we see people losing freedom to the extent that they got to choose between having a job or not, free speech flying away as we make choices to worship as the congregations of of Jesus against the dictates of worldly tyrants. Psalm 2 is about getting the big picture. Last week, In Psalm 1, we saw that it dealt with the urgent matter of each person's soul before God. That you must know where you're going. That that you must be a part of the congregation of the righteous. Psalm 2 says to us, you must know where history is going. 
You must see the whole landscape. You must understand that the world has been promised to the Lord Jesus Christ. That's Psalm 2. So if you're there, let's begin and notice in verses 1 to 3, obvious, the world hates God hates Christ and His people. Why do the nations rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and against His anointed, the Hebrew is Mashiach, Messiah, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. Yeah, that's experience of the world. It's an experience today where the kings or congresses or parliaments or federal bureaucracies or democracies or dictatorships, the foundational attitude of the nations, of its leaders, is we don't want this man to, and we don't want Yahweh to reign over us. The Creator? No. The hatred, the rebellion of this psalm is living itself out right now, today, on this earth. As it has throughout the centuries, And yet, in the third or first century A.D., the prophecy, the foretelling of what we are reading here plainly came to pass with the Jewish leadership's jealousy over over Jesus. They plotted to kill him and succeeded And then they were threatened by his followers, the apostles, and hauled them in, threw them in jail. And after they released them from jail, they went to gather together with the church and they prayed. And in their prayer, they quoted Psalm 2. Verses 1 to 2. Here's how Luke gives it to us in Acts 4, 24 to 29. They lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit. And here comes Psalm 2. Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against His anointed. For truly in this city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus whom you anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness. They knew this was about Christ Jesus. And they saw themselves caught up also in this psalm. Not only were the nations elites against Yahweh and against His Christ, but also against Christ's people. The church. Lord, look Upon their threats and grant to us courage to be faithful, 
to your word, to the truth. So Psalm 2 does imply that the Messiah's people will pay a huge price for belonging to him. The enmity, it'll vary from extreme to almost not noticing it from time to time over the centuries as history has borne out. But we just read that was persecution there in the early church in Jerusalem. Later, Peter and Paul will both be executed by the state of Rome. In the second and third centuries, there there were numerous sporadic, periodic, and very intense persecutions of Christians in the Roman Empire. And then during the Middle Ages, when quote-unquote, there became Christian religious hierarchical systems, it produced terrible persecution against Bible believers. When the demonic philosophy of Karl Marx found its legs in Lenin and Stalin, the blood of Christian martyrs flowed freely. And after World War II, when Satan personified himself in Chairman Mao's Communist Party takeover of China, the slaughter of many followed, especially Christians. Why do the nations rage and set counsel against the Creator and His Christ? That's a rhetorical question. It is the psalmist way of saying they're insane. If you're going to get a worldview, get it here from Psalm 2. God is God. And the world hates God and despises His Messiah and His people. That's the true worldview. Jesus held it. This is how he put it in John 15. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So Psalm 2 tells us, you must know, believer, the reality But you must know where all of this history is going. So in the face of the hostility of the world now in Psalm 2 comes these soothing words for God's people. Verses 4 to 6. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and testify, excuse me, and terrify them in his fury, saying, You got to get it. This is this is terrifying. Yahweh says. As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Human history is the story of horrific evil doing. And God's response at the rebellion of the leaders of the nations is... 
He laughs. He mocks at them. He ridicules them. The point is, the the picture is clear. In all of this, God's not faced. He never has been. He's not phased at an hysterical Adolf Hitler preaching to masses in the 1930s. He, he's not phased at the communist Soviet gulags of the 1950s and 60s or the crackdowns in communist China today or the authoritarian left's endeavor to take over the United States. God is not impressed. Wars and rumors of wars, totalitarian dictators, the thought that any of that throughout the millennia could ever thwart or undo God's purposes in His kingdom is utterly laughable. The Lord's people, what do we do? You hear what he says in verse 3 in the psalm. And it's ominous. And then you refocus with a view to the laughing king in verse 4. He who sits in the heavens laughs. The Lord holds them in derision. And God does not just laugh. He acts. Verse 5 and 6. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury. Saying, So hear the words of the rulers of this age in verse 3, side by side with what God, Yahweh, says. Verse 3, they say, let us burst their bonds apart. That is, the Creator in Christ. Cast them away from us. And God says, as for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. The king clearly is referring to the anointed in verse 2, the Hebrew Mashiach, the anointed one, Messiah. King is the one who was promised through the line of King David, the one who rules the world with all power and all authority as he is presently seated at the right hand of God, Jesus of Nazareth. Seat him on Zion, this little small piece of land on the southeastern corner of Jerusalem when David finally was anointed or came King, after Saul's death, he defeated the Jebusites for this hill, about 11 acres, called Zion. That's God. He places the king there. His kingdom starts in weakness. Some obscure town on the eastern Mediterranean. But it will eventually cover the planet. So we live in a world that hates God. It hates Christians. It hates the biblical worldview. It hates biblical morality. And that is growing more and more, that hatred in our own country. So what do we Christians do? First and foremost... We lift our eyes to Mount Zion. As Chris said this morning, presently that's happening. 
to the right hand of God where the resurrected human being who is Yahweh is seated with all authority and power given to him. We put our eyes on the king on the holy hill. Or the way that Revelation 4 puts it. At once I was in the spirit and behold a throne stood in heaven with one seated on the throne. And the four living creatures, each of them with six wings full of eyes all around and within. And day and night, they never cease to say, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty who was and is and is to come. Go back to Psalm 2. Notice now that David, by the Holy Spirit, he tells of a, a decree that was revealed to him. Verses 7 and 9. I will tell of the decree. Now David's out of the picture. It's not him speaking now. It's another voice. The Lord, that is Yahweh, said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Yahweh said to me, the me is the anointed king, the Messiah. You are my son. Today I have begotten you. What is clear in the psalm long before Christ came is that the Messiah is the legitimate king. When he says, I've begotten you, it's just his, his way here in the poetry of saying what he's already said. When Yahweh says, I have set my king, I have installed my king on the holy hill. Today I've installed you. Yahweh has installed the rightful king. Then the extent of his rule is made clear in verse 8. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. It is a worldwide kingdom, and it all belongs to Jesus. And then verse 9 speaks of the lethal force of his rule. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel, like clay pots smashed to smithereens. Just when we are warming up to King Jesus comes verse 9, where he, the Lord Jesus, turns violent against his enemies. See, you must read verse 9 in its context of verses 2 and 3. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against Yahweh and against His Christ, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. 
Jesus, you shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. When the time comes to fully enforce his kingly rule, Jesus will not be welcomed with open arms. He comes to a God-hating, anti-Christ world and with just a word from his mouth imposes absolute reign with overwhelming force. That is the decree that controls all of history. Listen to how Paul put this in 2 Thessalonians 1, 6 to 10. It is his worldview. God considers it just Oh, dear Christian Thessalonians, to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when, well, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire Inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. When Jesus comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. That's the difference between being of the world. And being one who by mercy has been plucked out of the world into the kingdom of God. And if that's you, then your worldview is transformed by verses 7 to 9. And it should affect the way that you educate your children and refuse to educate them. It should affect your politics it should affect your obedience to civil authorities. And it should affect your civil disobedience to government. The situations in this world can often feel scary. But believer, Psalm 2 and so many other places tell you that you know the end game of it all. You know what the decree is and how it shapes everything. And this great future assurance is what keeps God's people together during this present evil age. Now, he's not done. But let me preface that last part with, if you know and have read the books of the Chronicles of Narnia, in the first, the lion, the witch, in the wardrobe, Susan's talking to Mr. Beaver and he's telling her about the king who is the Christ figure, the lion, Aslan. And Susan wants to know, is he safe? <laughs> and Mr. Beaver responded, safe? Of course he isn't safe, but he's good. He's the king, I tell you. kings and the rulers of the world who are against God in verse 2 
They are the ones in the original context who are being addressed right now in verses 10 to 12. And they're being offered mercy. So those rebels or any of us rebels are called to make the only reasonable response. And now, therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve Yahweh with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry and you perish in the way, for His wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. So look, there, there are two incentives to respond to Jesus. The danger, it's one incentive, the danger you want to avoid, lest the Son be angry and you perish in wrath. The second is a great joy to experience. Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. Staying in rebellion or serving Yahweh. Kiss the Son of God. The kiss is a sign of submission in the context. In the ancient Near East, when one king conquered another, the sign of submission is the conquered king would come and plead for mercy and kiss the feet of the other king. And this is not just for earthly rulers, but this is for all rebels. All of us in this room here. Oh, sinner, serve Yahweh. Kiss the Son, Jesus the Messiah, and you will be blessed forever and ever. That's Psalm 2. Isn't it beautiful? Isn't it hope filled? Now, as I close, for hundreds of years, the faithful meaning those who were born again before Christ, the faith-filled, the Holy Spirit indwelt believers sang this song too in the midst of trials, in the midst of fears, in the midst of persecution. They knew the promise of Psalm 2 in the midst of all their trials. And they were on the right side of history. Now, here we are, and all of us, on this side of the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. We know particularly who the Messiah, who the King, who the Son is. And we know that He had come the first time as the suffering servant to bear the sins of all whom the Father would give to Him. And we rejoice. And yet we know that persecution and suffering, and cancer, and death are all around still. But we know that the culmination of 
this song is coming. A for instance, Revelation 21. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away. And the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them. And they will be His people, and God Himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage. And I will be his God. And he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. To conquer by remaining faithful as his son. That is the right side of history, no matter what the world or culture says. And so I close with the beautiful words of Psalm 2. As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry and you perish in the way, for His wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in Jesus. O oh, King Jesus, we thank you for the immeasurable love that you so loved us, the sheep, that you came, humbled yourself, became one of us truly, and went through the horrific, brutal torture and suffering. But more than that, poured out your soul to death. And had the Father, because of our sin, turn away. Oh, worthy are you, O oh Lamb of God. 
to receive all of our praise and adoration this very day. To the glory of your holy name. Amen and amen. Let's stand and worship King Jesus.